afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having us on today. Um, again, my name is Sheena Swanner. I'm the Director of Nutrition Programs here at AICR, and I'm really excited to be presenting alongside Dr. Nigel Brockton, our VP of Research. Today, our presentation is titled Diet, Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Cancer, What We Know and How to Use It. Dr. Brockton and I are gonna be taking you through AICR's 10 cancer prevention recommendations. We're gonna talk about the research and the supporting evidence behind the recommendations, and we're gonna provide practical tips and tools to help you easily implement the recommendations into everyday life. Further, we are gonna be touching upon the growing research um, on how following AICR's recommendations can improve survival and quality of life. And we're gonna highlight some great resources and tools for survivors to build healthy habits for recovery and a healthy life after cancer. So with that, I'm gonna pass it along to Dr. Brockton. Thank you, Sheena. Neither Sheena nor I have any disclosures to report. Um, if, if we were there in person, we'd be asking you how many of you are familiar with uh, AICR, um, but we're not there in person. So uh, we'll, we are the leading authority on the links between diet, weight, physical activity, and cancer prevention and survival uh, in the world. Um, we've been doing this for several decades uh, and have a, a very robust reputation uh, across the clinical and research world and in the, uh, the lay world too. Uh, our first expert report was uh, produced in 1997. This coincided with me starting my PhD, and it was a, an amazing resource to have to hand at that point. Um, the second expert report came out in 2007, and there'd been a huge growth in the, the amount of research that had been done. Uh, really, the first expert report was the first uh, comprehensive attempt to, to summarize all the evidence from around the world. But there were, there were definitely some weaknesses to it, although it was the best job that could, get, could be done at the time. Um, there was a lot of case control studies, a lot of susceptibility to bias. Um, and really, there was a whole process put in place for the second expert report, which is being continued on. Uh, through into the third expert report. Uh, I joined AICR in 2017. Um, so it was amazing to be part of the, the final stages of putting the third expert report together. Um, and this is where we are with, you know, a, this sort of exponential growth in research over this time, um, which has to a large extent confirmed what we um, initially thought, um, but also enabled us to really uh, focus in on what we do know and what we don't know. And that's the purpose of this talk today is to really uh, make it very clear what we do know, what we don't know, and what you can do about it. So the third expert report um, in its entirety is a massive document. The summary, if you ever get the chance to get your hands on it if, if we've been there in person we'd have brought some to you um, is 116 pages but this is really a sort of uh, a very high level summary of everything that's in there but all of this is available uh, on the web um, there are 17 cancers that have been covered in terms of individual reports focusing on the um, diet physical activity uh, nutrition and cancer, uh, but then there are these supporting chapters um, which talk about things like the, the cancer process, um, future research directions, how we judge the evidence, uh, and then these chapters that are based on the individual exposures. So in each cancer-specific report, it goes through the effects of each exposure, but then you can look, you know, if you're interested in what alcohol does, for instance, or what meat and fish does in terms of cancer, there are individual reports on that. So it's massive. And the, <clears throat> these are all based on systematic literature reviews and meta-analyses that are done, which just to give you an example, the breast systematic liter literature review is over 2000 pages, whereas the cup report uh, is, 
only about 200. But then all this is distilled down into the, the printed summary. So I see this is a kind of funnel of evidence because all of this information eventually leads us to these 10 cancer prevention recommendations that are based on a synthesis of the global literature. Uh, as I say, based on 17 cancers that all have a, um, a lifestyle uh, causal component to them, 51 million people and three and a half million cancer cases. So it is a gargantuan task. <laughs> But if you're interested in a particular factor and, you, and it's not covered in you know, the recommendations or in the summary or even the cup reports, you can go to the systematic literature reviews and look to see if it's addressed there. I recommend using the control find feature if it's something because <laughs> they're big, dense documents to get through. Uh, we'll be going through each of these recommendations uh, and the evidence that supports them uh, in this presentation. And Sheena is going to be giving you information about uh, how to actually implement those in your everyday life. So when we first launched these recommendations in 2018, uh, firstly, when, when they first came out internally, there was a little bit of kind of disappointment uh, that they weren't you know, internally, that they weren't dramatically different from the recommendations we made in 2007. They, they were really very similar, um, which is actually a strength because it shows that you know, we do know what we're talking about. Um, and it's not like in the, you know, in the, the press when one study will come out and say, this is good for you one day and bad for you the next day. This is consistent, reliable, evidence-based advice based on the totality of the evidence. Uh, the other thing that came out was someone made the comment of, well, there's one recommendation for body weight and one for physical activity, but then these kind of five that are really dietary related. Uh, and the question was, you know, is diet five times more, more important? Um, and it's not necessarily that, but diet is five times as complex as, as weight and physical activity. So rather than just saying someone eat a healthy diet, we tried to break it down into these evidence-based components, uh, which really direct people to a, a healthy lifestyle. And these all should be taken as a package. And the more of these you, you can meet, uh, the better off you are. Um, and as uh, one of our colleagues likes to say, this is a call for action, not perfection. <clears throat> Excuse me. So our first recommendation is to be a healthy weight. Keep your weight within the healthy range and avoid weight gain during adult life. And the evidence that supports this is really based on uh, 12 different cancers. Um, and this is everyone's... <laughs> For the last year of the pandemic, everyone's been a um, amateur epidemiologist. I'm just glad that people now know what an epidemiologist is. Uh, we don't work on skin. Um, so this is your little epidemiology tutorial. This is what we call a forest plot. And uh, you see each of the cancers listed down and then the risk that uh, number one that line represents zero risk. So if you're above that, uh, you're at an increased risk. And if you're below that, you're at a decreased risk. And you'll see that uh, for, for the bulk of these cancers, they're all above one. The strongest effect is 50% increase. So 1.5 means a 50% increased risk of endometrial cancer um, with a BMI above 30, uh, defining obesity. Um, and also the size of these blobs uh, shows you how large a population they're based on. So you can see that for uh, postmenopausal breast cancer and colorectal cancer, that's where the bulk of the, the research has been done. Um, and we have different ways of grading the evidence, which I'm not going to go into in this uh, talk. 
Um, but it's convincing for um, endometrial, esophageal, liver, kidney, postmenopausal breast cancer, pancreatic cancer, and colorectal cancer, and probable for these others. Really, the third expert report was the first one to come out and say, there is a protective effect of early adulthood uh, obesity in premenopausal breast cancer. We don't understand uh, how that works, but we know it's a real effect, and that's an area of uh, active research at the moment. Um, but you know, we, we can't recommend that people uh, have a higher BMI uh, in early life because the, the balance of probabilities is it would be harmful. So over to you, Sheena. All right, thank you. So this recommendation is all about, you know, um, being at a healthy weight. And so there's two main focus areas here. One, which is focusing on um, diet, eating pattern, and the other, which is physical activity. So when, when you think about following a healthy eating pattern, that's really, um, you know, focusing on foods that are going to be more plant-based, um, that are going to be high in fiber and other, you know, phytonutrients like uh, that are found in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans. Um, limiting those foods that are highly processed with added fats and sugars, limiting sugary beverages, and avoiding alcohol. And then with physical activity, um, the focus really is getting um, more activity in and making physical activity part of your normal lifestyle. AICR's recommendations really build upon each other, so um, I'll touch more in detail on both healthy eating pattern and physical activity throughout the presentation. Um, but this is a great segue to our second recommendation. Our next recommendation is to, to be physically active. Be physically active is part of your everyday life. Walk more and sit less uh, and limit sedentary behaviors. So sitting basically. Um, and again, the evidence uh, that supports this. Um, and if I was there in person, I'd be asking, what's this kind of plot called? But <laughs> we're not, so just answer in your head. Uh, it's a forest plot. It's another way of uh, this is presenting this evidence. So as you can see, for physical activity, these are all below zero. Uh, and the, the research that's been done has been based on different types of research for different cancers. Uh, and some, you know, for instance, endometrial, both occupational and recreational. Uh, activity reduce your risk. Um, in premenopausal breast cancer, it seems that vigorous activity is is more important. Um, but you know, in a, in addition to the impact on maintaining body weight, um, these are the independent effects, as much as we can tell, of, of being active, um, probably through the metabolic effects. Uh, of physical activity. So these are common cancers. So you know, that's why our, you know, in addition to the impact on body weight, the independent effect on these cancers mean that's why we have this uh, recommendation. Over to you, Sheena. All right, so the key here um, that I like to point out is, you know, everyone's gonna be at a different stage. And so start where you are in terms of physical activity. The, the goal is to get at least 30 minutes of activity in per day. And the national guidelines advise getting at least 150 minutes of moderate physical activity, which is about 30 minutes a day, or 70 minutes of 75 minutes of vigorous activity in per week. So think about how you can fit activity into your day. For some, it may be um, getting 30 minutes all at one time. For others, it may be splitting that activity up into two or three times. So um, with 15 minute intervals or even 10 minute intervals. Really it's that you're moving, that's really what matters the most here. And then I do wanna point out for, for those of you who may already be getting 30 minutes of activity in per day, you know, continue to increase that even more as you're able to. Um, even doing 45 or 60 minutes of activity um, is you know, gonna be beneficial. Any increase is gonna benefit you even more. Think about how you can replace your you know, current lifestyle habits that may be more sedentary with new ones. Um, you know, go on more walks with spring around the corner and the weather getting nicer. You know, take a walk outside, um, take the stairs you know, whenever possible. If you have stairs in your house, you know, walk up and down those stairs, get moving. 
if you're running errands, you know, going to the post office or grocery store, park further away, a great way to get in extra steps. Um, take your pets out, play with your pets, you know, take them out for a walk. Um, even while you're watching TV or while you're on the phone, you know, pacing back and forth, that's some, some great movement. And something that I've noticed, um, you know, working with clients that have found this really helpful is um, setting a, an alarm for movement or activity breaks. And that's a great way for individuals to um, have that little reminder of, hey, I need to get up and, and do some type of movement. Um, and that can help make that part of your regular routine. And I, I do like to point out too that movement and physical activity should, you know, be fun. It's, you know, going to make you feel good. So try new activities, um, new sports, um, new things. The more fun it is, the more likely you're, you know, going to be continuing that and making it part of your routine. So now we're going to get into the, the dietary recommendations. The first one is eat a diet rich in whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans. Make whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and pulses, legumes, such as beans and lentils, a major part of your usual daily diet. So there's multiple components to this. Again, you know, without getting into the details, uh, this is a forest plot where we're showing the, the studies that contribute to, to this evidence, uh, rather than this is all affecting colorectal cancer. Uh, and what, what we've shown from the evidence is that for each 90 grams of whole grains, uh, there's a 17% reduction in colorectal cancer risk. And as another component of uh, diet rich in um, plant foods, uh, for each 10 grams of fiber ingested, there's a 9% reduction in colorectal cancer risk. And uh, Sheena is going to talk to you about what the recommendation is, but it's three times that. So although the evidence is based on this it's what we call a dose response. So for how much, a linear dose response. So for, for each 10 gram increment, the risk is reduced by 9%. And you can see these studies all falling on the left-hand side of this line here. All right, so this recommendation really does focus on eating a diet that's rich in um, whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and beans, and making those foods a typical part of, your, of what you're eating every day. Um, and this slide here is a great visual of a healthy eating pattern where you're going to be able to incorporate those foods. This is AICR's New American Plate. Um, the plate here, as you can see, calls out and specifically highlights to make two thirds or more of your plate coming from those um, plant foods like those whole grains and fruits and vegetables, and then making one third or less of your plate coming from animal proteins. Um, so, you know, eating like this, this is a great kind of visual approach to build your meals around um, where you can really implement this recommendation. Um, this is a great visual too, because you can see it, it really has um, the proportion and then sensible portions of different foods, which can really help with a healthy weight. Um, you know, we know that eating like this really um, with the variety and the, the focus on the plant foods is really going to give you some great nutrients, um, you know, protective vitamins and minerals um, that are going to protect your health. And then to dig a little further into this recommendation, um, the goal here, as Nigel mentioned, is really to eat at least 30 grams of dietary fiber per day. And on this slide, you can see I've highlighted some high fiber foods, um, things like your avocados, berries, beans and lentils, your whole grains like your oatmeal. Um, and the fiber needs foods which are filled with fiber just has some great benefit. You know, we know that fiber can help make us feel full longer. Um, it slows digestion, um, you know, it can protect against weight gain and, and eating extra calories. Um, as Nigel mentioned, it can help protect against colorectal cancer um, with that 10 gram increase being linked to 9% um, risk of lowering for that for colorectal cancer. It can help with lowering blood sugar and cholesterol levels, and it can help that healthy bacteria in your gut. So think about you know, what you're eating um, and how you can kind of easily boost fiber intake in your day. Um, I, I don't recommend, you know, if you're thinking about what you typically eat and you're like, 
I don't get that much fiber. You don't want to go from zero to 30 grams in one day. You know, you do want to gradually increase that. Um, so that could even mean, you know, if for breakfast, if, you know, maybe you didn't have a fruit or a vegetable, you know, adding some, you know, a, a cup of raspberries or blueberries, um, or even spreading some avocado on your toast, which would, you know, give you that kind of um, great buttery, you know, taste, but also um, amp up the fiber there. So it's all about, you know, finding small areas through in your meals where you can boost it with some fiber and some plant foods here. Um, this is a, a great visual here of just focusing on plant foods that are going to be high in fiber. So of course, veggies and fruits are natural foods that are going to have a lot of fiber in them. And, um, you know, variety is going to be key. Don't just feel like you have to eat fresh. You can eat fresh, frozen, or canned. They're all going to count towards um, your fruit and vegetable intake. If you are choosing fresh fruits, you know, aim for those colorful, um, strongly flavored vegetables and fruits. They tend to have um, the best sources of phytochemicals, which are those plant compounds that are found in plant foods. So for overall, you know, good health, we recommend to eat at least three and a half cups per day of any type of veggie or fruit. And you can see on this slide, um, common one cup equivalents to fruits and vegetables. So um, 12 baby carrots would be about a cup um, or one cup cooked spinach or any leafy green or two cups of, of raw. So think about, you know, where, you know, you can include more fruits and vegetables again throughout your day. This is a, a great way um, for me to also point out that there's no one magical fruit or vegetable or food rather that's going to protect you from cancer or any other chronic disease. It's really the individual vitamins, minerals, and phytochemicals and how they work together that's really going to give you the biggest benefit. So that's why, you know, you'll really hear me say throughout the variety is key here. Um, and then along with, with the fiber message, you know, the recommendation also calls out on um, really choosing more whole grains in our diet. Whole grains are going to provide, you know, dietary fiber, again, along with some other nutrients um, than compared to refined grains. And when you think about a whole grain versus a refined grain, um, a whole grain really is exactly what it sounds like. It's the whole part of the grain seed. So with that, it's just going to have more nutrients than compared to the refined grain, which is not going to include the whole part of that. Um, the goal here, again, is to swap out refined grains that you may be eating regularly, things like white bread, white rice, um, for flavorful whole grain options. The goal here is to eat at least three servings of whole grains per day, um, or 90 grams. And this visual here on the slide shows you what a serving of a whole grain looks like. So that's about the equivalent to one slice of 100% whole grain bread, um, half a cup of cooked brown rice, three cups of air popped popcorn, or a six inch corn tortilla. So, you know, think about how, you know, if you're eating three meals a day and, and you're eating at least one serving of a whole grain with each meal, you've easily um, met this goal. Think about how, you know, if you have a sandwich with two slices of 100% whole grain bread, you've already had two servings right there. So this is a really um, easy recommendation to implement. So again, you know, I talked about ways that you can implement this recommendation, but it's all about starting where you are and working on adding more plant foods to your to your overall, you know, daily intake. Um, variety again is going to be key. So focus on different fruits and vegetables, even trying different whole grains, um, fresh, frozen, and canned fruit and vegetables all count. Now, you know, they've made it made it really easy for us to even have frozen um, whole grains that you can choose for convenience. Um, think about, you know, small swaps that you can make because that's really going to make a, a really big difference. You know, over time that really adds up. And this is a great way too for, you know, somebody that maybe doesn't have a lot of variety in their diet. You, you do recognize that. It's a great way to have fun and try new choices. Um, there's so many great ancient whole grains out there, um, such as farro or quinoa that you can, you know, easily add into a recipe in place of Know, rice or noodles. So have fun experimenting. Um, even with fruits and vegetables now, there's so many varieties available um, at the grocery store and even farmers markets year round. So, you know, have fun trying that out. Um, it's, it's really a great way to 
to be beneficial for your health as well. Our next uh, recommendation is limit consumption of fast foods and other processed foods high in fat, starches or sugars. Uh, limiting these foods will help control calorie intake and maintain a healthy weight. So you know, this is almost the flip side of what uh, Sheena was just telling us to do. Um, because hopefully the more of those uh, good nutrient dense uh, calorie, low calorie um, foods people are eating, plant based foods, the fewer of these are eating. The direct evidence for fast foods is mainly from actually the, the obesity literature. Two years ago, we came out with the diet, nutrition and physical activity, energy and uh, body fatness report. So this was an umbrella review uh, looking at all of the evidence that was available for the determinants of weight gain, overweight and obesity. Because this is such an important factor in cancer risk, uh, and it's really the second most, uh, second strongest risk factor for cancer after smoking. And you can see some of the, um, the, the usual culprits here. Um, fast foods are in there um, as probable increasing uh, cancer risk uh, and whole grains and fruits and vegetables uh, reduce, sorry, in fast foods increasing weight gain, overweight and obesity and whole grains, fruits and vegetables. By the way that we um, assess the evidence, these only came out as limited suggestive. We know that they're, they're helpful in reducing cancer risk. There's a limited suggestive, uh, just because of the quality of the evidence. These, because diet is so complex, it's really hard to um, get hard and fast answers on it. Um, but this is the best estimates that we have. Um, you know, we're in this probable area is Mediterranean type di dietary pattern, which does include a lot of these uh, whole grains, fruits and vegetables. Um, and as I say, this is more from the, um, the weight gain, overweight and obesity um, research rather than cancer research. Uh, but these are um, strong and consistent factors uh, in weight gain, overweight and obesity. All right. So, you know, this recommendation really calls on limiting, you know, avoiding processed foods and fast foods. Um, these foods are going to be high in fats sugar, starches, and just are overall less nutrient dense. Things include, you know, you can see on the slide, um, I have some pictures of some of those foods. So things like uh, hot dogs, hamburgers, fried foods, prepackaged baked goods, um, even your instant soups and noodles. Um, research shows that these foods are often not only consumed frequently, but also in large portions. And that can again lead to excess calories and, and weight gain and, and leading to overweight and obesity. I do want to point out here, when we talk about avoiding high fat foods, it doesn't include the nat natural plant foods with healthy fat. So it does not include things like your nuts, seeds, nut butters, um, vegetable oils, and avocado. It's really those processed foods that we're, we're referring to. So, you know, what can you do to limit consumption of these foods in, in your regular dietary patterns? Um, first, I want to point out that there are four categories of foods. There's unprocessed or minimally processed foods, processed culinary ingredients, processed foods, and ultra-processed foods. And AICR's concern here is really with that ultra-processed food category. Because I will say not all processed foods are technically bad for you. Anything that has been modified in any way, even if it's cut or frozen, is technically processed. So you know, with that, a, a bag of frozen broccoli is technically processed, but we're not worried about that. You know, that's a great choice to, to make. That's not really our concern. It's with that ultra processed food category, which has a long list of ingredients, um, has a lot of added salt, sugars, fats. It's just an, a food that's been highly manipulated. So the goal here is to really um, limit these foods and swap them for healthier alternatives. So, you know, for example, if you're eating, um, you know, a, a bag of or a, a loaded French fries, you know, it has added salt and you know other toppings. You know, even substituting that for a, a plain baked potato or a sweet potato, you know, that's really going to go a long way. Um, hot dogs or deli meats, you know, again, very processed. 
even substituting that for maybe a tuna sandwich um, or even a, a peanut butter almond butter sandwich. It's all about finding um, small swaps you can make here. Talking of deli meats and hot dogs, uh, our next recommendation is to limit consumption of red and processed meat. Eat no more than moderate amounts of red meat, uh, such as beef, pork, and lamb, and eat little, if any, processed meat. Now, we're not saying you can never have a hot dog, but that sort of daily consumption or regular consumption, uh, we certainly recommend against. And this is based on consistent evidence, as you can see, back to the forest plots. These are all the studies that have been done uh, going back, or all the eligible studies that have been done going back uh, over 20 years. And you can see that almost all uh, to the right of this line. And the summary estimate is that uh, this is for red and processed meat. There's a 12% increased colorectal cancer risk. This recommendation here um, really calls out to eating modest amounts of red meat. Um, so that's equivalent to no more than 12 to, ounce, 12 to 18 ounces cooked and to consume little if any processed meat you know, saving them for special occasions. So I do want to start here by reviewing um, what uh, red and processed meats are. Red meat are going to be um, anything that's beef, lamb, or pork, any mammalian meat. And then processed meats are going to include things like your cold cuts, bacon, sausage, ham. Um, really, a processed meat is any kind of meat that's been preserved by smoking, curing, salting, or any addition of a chemical additive. Um, for, to help with the preservation process. So as Nigel mentioned, this recommendation doesn't say, you know, never eat these, these um, it's really cutting back specifically with the red meat intake. Um, so it's all about reorienting your plate and um, visualizing, you know, just different portions. Um, so it's, it, it's a good thought process instead of thinking of what you're giving up, think about, you know, some other choices that you can gain that may have been overlooked. Um, for example, you know, try to eat um, seafood twice a week, um, even experiment with um, different plant proteins like tofu or edamame, or even a variety of beans um, and lentils. So it's a great way to, uh, to try some other protein, healthier protein alternatives. Um, so I want to take you through kind of different meals and, and talk about some easy swaps you can do. So for breakfast, you know, we traditionally um, think of bacon and sausage. So again, a healthier protein alternative here would be, you know, like a boiled egg or even um, some seasoned beans or tuna. Um, for lunch, you know, I had mentioned earlier, swapping out kind of some of those processed meats with um, nut butters or even bean spreads like hummus um, would be a great option. Also, oftentimes when we are, you know, grilling, we often think of hot dogs and hamburgers. It's a great way, you know, you can easily grill um, other delicious options. So even putting fish like salmon on the grill, um, grilling portobello mushroom, mushrooms and using that in place of a hamburger patty. Portobello mushrooms have really great kind of meaty consistency. So they're a great substitute there. Um, throwing on uh, chicken or um, fish and veggie kebabs are, are always fun. And then even if you are gonna do any type of a burger, making a chicken or turkey burger, um, so you can kind of control what, what, you're, you know, what you're putting in there. Um, even if you think about just traditional dinners, like uh, if you're having a taco Tuesday night, you know, think about other options you can use. You could do shrimp tacos or fish tacos. Um, you could also make it completely plant-based by using um, black beans. So it's all about kind of reorienting um, what you're doing, reorienting your plate. And also it's a great way to, when you're, if you think of a recipe you like that might be, you know, meat heavy, think about alternatives you can, you can make. Limit consumption of sugar sweetened drinks. Drink mostly water and unsweetened drinks. We know that these can contribute to uh, overweight, weight gain and obesity. Um, convincing evidence for that. There's basically just no good reason to to drink these these products um, they are extremely calorie dense they have very little effect on satiety i mean that sort of feeling of full uh, so they're just empty calories um, 
even for fruit juices, we recommend only um, one glass per day. Um, so you know, eliminating these, uh, if these are common items in your um, diet, um, we recommend that you avoid those. All right. So yeah, the, the big thing is to limit consumption of any sugar sweetened drinks um, that you're frequently consuming. So the recommendation really focuses on um, drinking mostly unsweetened drinks like water, unsweetened coffee, and unsweetened tea. So this is a great way to have a little fun with what you're drinking um, and get creative. Um, you can flavor your water naturally by adding fresh fruits or herbs to enhance flavor. Um, you can do that in your water or even your unsweet tea. Um, one of my favorite things to do in the summer is to put in frozen peach slices and fresh herbs like mint or basil into an unsweet tea. Um, you know, frozen fruit chunks are a great substitute to ice cubes and they add a nice pop of flavor. Um, same thing with your coffee, you know, try to aim for unsweetened coffee. Um, you can enhance the flavor there by adding kind of some spices like cinnamon, nutmeg, or even allspice and some vanilla extract to kind of boost those flavors. And then, you know, as Nigel mentioned, it's even with fruit drinks or, or fruit juices, we still recommend um, to limiting that. I will say, you know, watch out. A lot of times drinks can be labeled as a fruit drink, um, but they're really just added with a lot of sugar. So make sure if you are drinking fruit juice, you're um, limiting that to 100% fruit juice and no more than six ounces per day. Limit alcohol consumption. Uh, for cancer prevention, it's best not to drink alcohol. And so another kind of epidemiology plot for you to, to get your, your heads around. Uh, these are non-linear dose responses. So this is alcohol intake along the bottom uh, and the risk associated with it uh, up the side. And these blue lines are the confidence interval. So that tells us when something is statistically significant. So we can see for something like esophageal cancer, this, this line, again, is this is the, the sort of baseline risk. Uh, you know, if you're above it, um, it's an increased risk. And if you're below it, it's a decreased risk. And really for, for um, esophageal cancer, any, any daily alcohol consumption increases your risk quite rapidly. For colorectal cancer, uh, we can see that it becomes, when these confidence intervals uh, do not include one, that's when it becomes statistically significant. And we can see that that happens uh, just above kind of 20 um, grams of, of ethanol a day. Um, so, a standard US uh, drink is 14 grams. So you're not even at two drinks per day, uh, which is still the recommendations in the, the sort of limit for um, the, the new dietary guidelines for Americans. Um, the breast cancer um, curve looks a lot more like this, but just goes straight up. So any daily uh, alcohol intake, uh, increase your risk of breast cancer. Um, you know, we're not saying you can never drink, <laughs> um, but certainly the alcohol increases the risk of six types of cancer. Um, and actually five of those cancers are more common in men than women. So uh, we were quite vocal about the fact that we, we agreed with the Dietary Guidelines Committee uh, and the scientific report that they should have made the recommendations the same for men and women, uh, but they've kept the existing recommendation. The other question we always get is, well, what about wine? Surely wine's good. Um, it's good for your heart, they say. And uh, unfortunately, no, um, it doesn't matter what you drink. Um, most of, the, most of the research has actually been done on total alcohol intake, but when you break it down by beer, wine, spirits, they're all to the right of this line. They're all an increased risk. Uh, this is particularly for um, breast cancer. We see it, it doesn't differ by pre or postmenopausal breast cancer. Uh, it increases your risk of all of them. Um, and even the, 
the reason that the dietary guidelines committee recommended uh, a reduction in the limit for for men um, is that you know a, a growing awareness that there are no beneficial effects of of drinking alcohol um, the a lot of the research that supported cardiovascular benefits um, was from longer ago um, and really although as i say we're not saying you can never have a drink but certainly in moderation and not on a, a daily basis so again the recommendation you know the key message here is for cancer prevention it's best not to drink alcohol um, so if you are going to drink you know nigel did point out you know follow national guidelines which is no more than two drinks a day for men and no more than one drink a day for women. Of course, you know, less is, is gonna be better. So on this slide, you can see what counts as one drink. Um, you know, pay attention to the amount of alcohol in a drink, because oftentimes, um, depending on, you know, the pour, it could count as more than one drink. Um, I also like to point out that um, one drink here, you can see uh, 12, it, for beer specifically, a 12 ounce bottle um, or can of beer is equivalent to one drink. But now many craft beers are really popular and they just have a higher alcohol um, percentage in 12 ounces. So you're really getting more than one drink there. So definitely watch out for that. So again, it's similar to sugary beverages. You know, it's a, this is a great way to kind of think about how you can get creative. Um, there's two ways, you know, we, we really want you to cut back on the amount of alcohol you're drinking and then also even replacing alcohol with, you know, non-alcoholic beverages or even reduced alcohol beverages. Um, so things that you can do here, um, you know, choosing fla uh, flavoring your, your plain water with kind of some of those things I mentioned earlier, like fruit and herbs, um, or also, you know, even making a lower um, alcohol content beverage by putting a splash of wine um, into some sparkling water and making your own spritzer. This is a great visual. Um, I really love this here. This slide shows you kind of how you can build a healthier beverage. And this kind of, again, is, is great for um, reducing alcohol intake, um, but also for the previous recommendation of reducing sugary beverage intake. Um, so first of all, you start out with a, a beverage base here. That could be um, a sparkling water, club soda, seltzer water, um, and then second, you know, have fun with your healthy enhancers, your um, fresher frozen fruit chunks, citrus peels, um, and then, you know, thirdly, add that extra pop of flavor. You can throw in, um, again, fresh herbs or even spices, um, coconut water. It's a great way for you to have fun and, and experiment with new flavor choices. Um, and also when you are creating something on your own and, and building it, you can kind of control what's going into it. A lot of times when you're ordering some of these drinks out, they're going to be packed with just added calories um, that are often hidden. Uh, do not use supplements for cancer prevention. Aim to meet nutritional needs through diet alone. So this is research that's gone on since, you know, forever. <laughs> um, I was actually uh, a cancer patient in uh, my late teens and early 20s, when beta carotene was the, the big story. Um, and my mother was duly giving me beta carotene supplements, and then they had to stop the trials early because it actually increased the, the recurrence of lung cancer, increased the risk of lung cancer. So there's been a lot of research done on this, and none of them have really come out to show overall benefits. So there are reasons to take supplements, um, but not for cancer prevention. The one area you may see a, a difference in this is in calcium supplements for colorectal cancer. Um, but of the, although they, there's pretty consistent risk that they reduce uh, colorectal cancer risk, uh, this is certainly a conversation to be had um, with a healthcare provider, and only really if you're at some enhanced risk of colorectal cancer, um, because for the general population, uh, they're potentially harmful, they may increase the risk of prostate cancer. Um, so although there is, you know, this is for highest versus lowest level of uh, supplemental um, calcium, um, but overall, for cancer prevention, 
it's best not to rely on supplements and to try and meet your nutritional needs uh, through diet. So yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, focusing on what you're eating is really going to be key here. Um, where can you swap some more nutrient rich foods with maybe foods that you're eating that don't provide as much nutrition? And this is where, you know, we, we continue to say small changes really can make a big impact here. So visualize how your plate looks like. If you think back to the new American plate principle that I, I mentioned earlier, you know, this is a good guide um, to where you can get a, a wide variety of nutrients, if, you know, for, especially from the plant foods. Um, so again, as Nigel mentioned, um, supplements are going to be different. Every person in every situation is different. So in some, some situations, a dietary supplement may indeed be something that's recommended, um, but you do want to continue to have that conversation with your healthcare provider. For mothers, breastfeed your baby if you can. Obviously, this only uh, applies to a, a segment of the population, uh, but it's good for the baby. Um, there's evidence that it reduces the subsequent risk uh, of cancer and weight gain and uh, overweight and obesity, uh, and also reduces the breast cancer risk uh, in the mother. So... Um, our advice aligns with the World Health Organization um, to breastfeed for six months um, or as, as much as possible up to two years. And then after a cancer diagnosis, follow the, our recommendations if you can. Um, again, check with your health professional what is right for you. Uh, I think we have another slide. Um, I know that uh, this audience is particularly interested in the impact of these recommendations uh, in the survivorship setting. There is, a, fortunately, an increasing uh, population of cancer survivors um, in the world. The latest estimate is there's 32 million people worldwide living with a cancer diagnosis. Um, and but it, it has to be said that the evidence is much more limited for the role of these factors in survivorship but there is persuasive evidence on diet nutrition and physical activity um, that they address uh, following these recommendations does confer better outcomes um, but the evidence is still limited and we are very cautious about uh, are making specific recommendations um, because of that limitation of evidence, but it is increasing. And sometime this year, um, there will be the, um, the revision of the 2014 breast cancer um, survivorship report uh, coming out. Um, and from, from all of the evidence uh, and the effect of these recommendations on uh, overall health, uh, it's unlikely that following these recommend recommendations could be harmful to survivors after they finish treatment. Uh, and this is this whole area is a, a key, it was identified as a key future research direction in the third expert report and is a current research priority, not just for AICR, but for many uh, cancer related organizations uh, around the world. So just to give you um, a little snapshot of the only survivorship report that we've done so far, um, which was in 2014, but actually because of the process, the very rigorous process this goes through, the, the cutoff for the evidence that was incorporated into that report um, was actually um, in about August 2012. Um, so that's almost, you know, in terms of the evidence, that's almost 10 years ago. And at that point, taking a very rigorous approach to uh, how, we, um, how we judge the evidence, nothing was in this strong, uh, convincing, probable category. Lots of things in the limited suggestive. Uh, and that's really where... Um, the focus has been to try and improve the resolution and uh, strength of evidence in those areas. So what do we know? This is, 
if you had a copy of the third expert report, you would see this big uh, chart in the back, which gives, I know it's very small on your screens, but it has all the cancers down here and all of these exposures um, sort of grouped into fruit and veg, and red and processed meat, uh, diet and nutrition, uh, and physical activity and body fatness. And you can see for some factors, for instance, this one down the middle is alcoholic drinks, you know, crops up a lot in a lot of these cancers, uh, adult body fatness based on BMI um, is for these 12 cancers. Um, but then if we go kind of across the way, colorectal cancer has the most factors that we, we know are either um this is this includes uh, limited and suggestive um associations within the report there's also one that is just a strong evidence matrix and i think i have that next yeah this so for for colorectal cancer there's 10 factors that um are strongly associated with increasing or decreasing your risk um breast is next it has seven factors um, but then you have things like prostate cancer where other than adult body fatness and adult attained height which is not really modifiable uh, we have very little strong evidence for what are the factors so again active area of research um, but sort of realizing what we know and what we can do but when you look at these as a whole, for instance, the um, fruit non-starchy vegetables, these were aggregated across all of the aerodigestive cancers, um, whereas individually the, the effect was not um, very strong. Um, but we know a lot and it all supports the recommendations that we provided and those recommendations are also uh, likely to be beneficial in the survivorship setting. So one way of uh, sort of assessing that is to score adherence to, to these recommendations. And what is the effect um, of adhering to these recommendations on cancer risk and, and outcomes after cancer diagnosis? People did this in a kind of ad hoc way um, using the 2007 recommendations. And most of the research that's been done so far is based on those 2007 recommendations, which are very similar. So, you know, they are somewhat um, translatable. Um, but once we had published the, the 2018 report, um, we collaborated with the National Cancer Institute um, to come up with a standardized scoring system. And I'm going to go through this very quickly. It's basically a sort of traffic light um, system where we selected the, the components that were, um, that should be incorporated. And so uh, you can't have the, the recommendation for survivors as part of this because if someone's already, uh, it's kind of double dipping uh, and we took the supplements out of it. So what we were left with uh, was the other seven plus breastfeeding. Um, and very quickly, again, this is based on the 2007 uh, score. Um, when you look at the effect of individual meeting each uh, recommendation so taking each recommendation as a point um so to seven or eight points according to the scoring systems that were used uh overall there's a 10 percent decreased risk of breast cancer 14 percent decrease of colorectal cancer seven percent decreased risk of lung cancer this is per point uh per increment of score and then for mortality, 10% reduction in overall mortality and a 9% reduction in cancer specific mortality. And these aren't based, this is based on you know, 38 studies, 18, uh, sorry, 17 prospective 
uh, eight case control and 13 cross-sectional studies that used these, uh, this score to try and uh, assess the outcome um, on cancer and, and survival. And then you know, beyond just the hard endpoints of survival and cancer risk, um, there's also impacts on quality of life and physical functioning, uh, reduce uh, fatigue and vomiting, so more on the um, symptoms management during treatment. Uh, for colorectal cancer, better overall physical functioning, because uh, it's not just about surviving, it's about living. Uh, and lower prevalence of metabolic syndrome among breast cancer survivors uh, with higher uh, adherence. So, you know, yes, following the recommendations reduces your cancer risk, but it also improves your survival and improves your quality of life after a diagnosis. All right. Um, well, I have a, today, I'm excited to just go over some of AICR's programs and tools with you today. So I'm going to take a few minutes to review each one. So next slide, and I'll start with um, the first one, AICR's Cancer Health Check. This is a really fun and easy to use interactive tool that can help you determine where you are in regards to meeting AICR's um, cancer prevention recommendations that we discussed today. So um, it's completely online based. You'll answer a series of questions um, on you know, what you're eating and how much you move along with a few other lifestyle related questions. And then you'll be provided with some personalized feedback and kind of a report card summary. Um, it will highlight areas that you're doing well in and highlight areas that you still need some improvement upon. So it's a really good kind of first step for you to see um, where you are in meeting our recommendations. Um, you can easily access Cancer Health Check from your phone, um, even a computer or a tablet, and it can be taken in under five minutes. So it's pretty quick and easy, and it's a really great tool to kind of take as that first step. So I next want to introduce um, the Healthy 10 Challenge, which is actually a new program we recently launched um, actually last week. The Healthy 10 Challenge is a 10-week um, program that's completely online-based. It's a practical approach um, to putting our recommendations into action. And so there's 10 challenges um, kind of following the 10 recommendations. Each challenge, each week focuses on a challenge that's either um, diet or nutrition related or physical activity kind of and in, in focusing on movement. It's really designed to meet individuals where they are to help them continue their health, healthy habits or build upon healthy habits, you know, all for lowering cancer risk and also other chronic diseases. So once you do register and sign up for the challenge, you'll start receiving weekly emails that kind of help guide you and motivate you throughout the 10 weeks. Um, the challenge features delicious recipes, um, great nutrition handouts and resources, and you can get signed up. I have the website listed here at healthychallenge.org. Um, and I do encourage you to have fun, you know, sign up with a friend or a family member. It's always fun to try, try some new recipes with others. So some of you may be familiar with this next program, which is Coping, and Can Coping with Cancer in the Kitchen, or CCK for short. Um, many of you may have even partic participated in the challenge as CSCLA was a premier site for CCK. CCK was specifically designed for cancer survivors. It's an eight-week program that's evidence-based. It's led by a registered dietitian and a mental health practitioner. It's again also based on our recommendations. Each session kind of focuses on um, a wide range of topics related to diet and emotional well-being. And it's a really good um, program to help survivors kind of share their experiences and participate in structured group activities. Um, this next program is uh, called iThrive, which is a program that specifically was built for survivors to become more proactive about their health. AICR has partnered with the team at Five to Thrive to be able to offer this program, and it really focuses on the integrative approach to health. It's an online-based program that creates personalized and actionable wellness plans around diet, movement, environment, rejuvenation, and spirit. Um, so again, this is online-based. So after you sign up for the program, you will ask um, to complete a pretty in-depth questionnaire 
which will then be used to create a personalized lifestyle program and plan for, for you. From that plan, then you can kind of choose the individual areas that you want to focus on improving, whether that's movement or um, spirit. So it's a really fun um, kind of program that can help turn that science information into actionable activities. And then lastly, I do want to point you um, towards AICR's Healthy Recipes. We have just, you know, some delicious recipes available on our website. And I know throughout this presentation, you know, we focus on a healthy eating pattern and that's kind of really a heavy focus on several of our recommendations. So um, definitely check our healthy recipes page out. You can search by specific ingredient or even a specific type of dish. Um, we've also recently added in some new recipes that may be helpful for individuals that are, um, that are maybe undergoing treatment um, and they take into consideration certain side effects like constipation, dry mouth, or nausea. So um, I have a link up there where you can check these recipes out as well. And um, you know, I'm really excited that we got to talk to you all today. Um, continue to stay connected with us. You can you know, go to our website, which is listed here, www.aicr.org. Um, to just get the latest, you know, resources and information that we have. Um, you can even sign up for, we have several um, online free email publications, which are listed there, um, which kind of is a, a nice information right to your inbox. We have our recharge um, publication that I like to point out, which is specifically for cancer survivors. So it has some great articles and recipes in there. And then also we are active on social media. So if you are on social media, be sure to follow us along there as well. To get to some of the questions, our first question is, what does the research say about dairy and cancer risk, particularly breast cancer risk? So the research is pretty clear um, that dairy does not increase your risk uh, of cancer overall. Um, there is quite a, a relatively strong and consistent reduced risk uh, with higher dairy consumption in breast cancer. And that is completely contrary to some of the claims made by some groups and individuals uh, who are quite vocal in the, <clears throat> in the cancer space. Um, given the strength of that evidence, it seems that some of the claims being made have now moved to a more, oh, well, it doesn't increase the risk of breast cancer but it increases the progression of cancer. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't actually addressed in the 2014 uh, Breast Cancer Survivorship Report or the SLR, the Systematic Literature Review. Um, it is addressed in the 2000, well, what will hopefully be the 2021 uh, Breast Cancer Survivor Report. Um, I am not going to give any spoilers, but I will say there is no reason not to drink, not to consume dairy uh, in terms of cancer survival uh, concerns, um, which is a bit of a spoiler, really. But uh, it's it's an important issue because it comes up all the time. Uh, dairy is also linked to a reduction in colorectal cancer risk. Um, there is some suggestion that there may be an increased prostate cancer risk, um, but overall, uh, dairy is a, a low concern for, for cancer risk. I, I also want to jump in and, and, you know, I get this question a lot too, you know, dairy products do provide a lot of great nutrients, um, like, you know, a lot of vitamins and minerals or calcium and vitamin D, um, so it's still going to give that that good supplement you know in place of supplements if you will i know that's also a common question that we get wonderful thank you both of you and thank you nigel for that spoiler i'm sure we appreciate the spoiler <laughs> uh next question what is unambiguously known about saturated fat and cancer risk does the source of the saturated fat make a difference for example are saturated fats from organically raised animals and from dairy products less harmful than other sources of saturated fat? All right, so yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, saturated fat, first of all, is any kind of a fat that's 
if you think about it, it's a liquid or it's a solid at room temperature, if you will. Um, so that's kind of as opposed to unsaturated fats, which are typically healthier that are liquid at room temperature. So if you think about our recommendations and what we talked about today, um, it's, it's really about eating more plant foods, which are going to be lower in saturated fat, of course. Um, but we, there are still some plant foods that have saturated fat that we still, you know, say eat in moderation, which are, are going to, again, come from things like your uh, nuts, seeds, avocados, which we know are just healthier than, you know, some of those um, saturated fats that come from animal sources like red meat. Um, Nigel, do you have anything that you'd want to add on to that? Yeah, the, the specific risk with saturated fats and cancer um, is, is not a, it's not a very strong effect, uh, you know, in, independent of the whole sort of dietary patterns that are associated with those uh, higher intakes of saturated fat, but as a specific component. Um, and, and, you know, we just have to go on the, the evidence that's out there. And there, there isn't really evidence um, for, depending on how, how particular animals were raised, whether it's organic, whether it's grass fed, not, there just isn't, these are not um, frequently, commonly in, uh, consumed enough components to be able to do uh, sort of reliable or compelling research on. So yeah, that's not to say that uh, there isn't research going on at the moment. Um, but it's really difficult to get at those individual components. And it's, it is much more about that sort of balanced dietary pattern than looking individually at specific intakes of, of very specific components. Great, thank you. Next question, what does the research say about plant-based proteins such as Beyond Meat and Impossible Burger substitutions to regular animal sources of meat? All right, that's a that's a really great question, and um, I definitely heard a lot about that right. You know, when those kind of first came out, um, you know, I want to start out by saying that a, that a lot of these kind of plant based burgers, like Beyond Meat and Possible Burger, they are still kind of they technically fall into that highly processed category. Um, so again, we also don't know the research; they are newer foods, so. Um, it all goes back to we just don't know enough about them. But if you think about, you know, the messaging that we've talked about, they are more processed. So, you know, they're still not recommended to eat regularly. Now, you know, if you have an occasional Beyond Burger, you know, it's, it's all about moderation. Um, that's, you'll hear me say that, you know, and you have heard me say that throughout the presentation. Um, so, yes, you can try them, but we just don't have enough information on on them in regards to our research. What Sheena said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, what does the research say about organic foods and cancer risk? Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Nigel. Well, um, basically we don't have enough uh, evidence to show that there's any um, benefit. There have been papers published and there was a big um, Nutrisante French study um, that came out a couple of years ago um, showing quite large effects or potential or purportedly beneficial effects of um, organic foods. But the, the chance of bias is very strong because, you know, I may eat organic food every now and again, but I don't know what food is actually organic because I, I don't make a particular effort to, to eat organic food. So those people who self-report eating organic are already more health conscious because they are making a deliberate um, decision to select those products. So it's really difficult to... Um, you would need to do some sort of blinded study where you give one, pe one group of people uh, organic and another group of people non-organic to, to really answer that question reliably. Um, you know, from an AICR point of view, we just want people to eat more vegetables and it really doesn't matter whether they're organic or not. But 
Sheena probably has some additional uh, insights. Yeah, I mean, I think it's exactly what you said. Um, we just don't know. There's not enough research. But really, um, it goes back to earlier when I was highlighting when you think about fruit and vegetable intake, you know, fresh, frozen, canned, that all counts. What we really, bottom line, want you to do is eat those foods regularly. However, you know, is going to be best for, for you. And that is going to depend on the individual and their situation. Um, so eat your fruits and veggies, you know, get a variety. In. Well, to follow up on that, Sheena, one of the questions we have is, should fruit be limited because of its sugar content if you're at a healthy weight? Do tomato and lemon juice count in your fruit juice consumption for the day? So, yeah, great question. And, um, you know, fruit is nat has natural sugar in it and fruit has fiber and vitamins and it's, it's you know, overall going to be a, a great food. Um, I think for some individuals, they, depending on, you know, their condition and chronic diseases, they may, you know, have to limit fruit consumption, but overall, you know, it's not something that I want people to avoid because um, they're scared of the sugar content. Because again, that's going to be that natural sugar that, that we're not concerned about. You know, we are concerned about the added sugars, sugar, syrup, honey, the food, the, those sugars that are added into foods where fruit does not have those. Um, I will say that, you know, one area to be cautious of is you may find added sugar in a lot of dried fruit. So, you know, always look at your food packaging. Um, that, that's one area that I would say, you know, that can add up quickly and really have some hidden calories there. Um, now, as far as fruit juice goes and how that converts over into fruit or vegetable consumption, you know, I think that the big thing is, you know, yes, one glass can be an equivalent if it's 100% juice serving. Um, lemon juice, not so much, because I don't know anyone that's gonna drink uh, eight, you know, six to eight ounces of lemon juice, but you know, tomato juice or any other fruit juice. But again, um, I really recommend getting your fruit and vegetable intake and a majority of it from the actual fruit or vegetable itself. Great, thank you. Um, is duck considered a red meat and is chicken okay to eat? So, yeah, um, great question. So chicken and um, duck, both are gonna be considered, they're not falling into that red meat category. Um, and it's all about kind of envisioning that, that plate method we talked about, you know, making two thirds of your plate coming from those plant foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains and beans. And then, you know, that, the other remainder, one third um, from, from other sources. So again, you can still eat them. It's all about how much the proportion you're eating. Great, thank you. What does research say about soy intake and its risk for breast cancer? That it's safe. Um, there, because there are um, Molecule compounds within uh, soy that can look like uh, estrogen, basically. Um, there was concern that it may increase uh, breast cancer risk, but it's both safe in in terms of cancer risk and in cancer survivors. So um, there is no reason to avoid soy uh, in either of those settings. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, one member says, I know we are supposed to avoid alcohol, but how about cooking with wine and why should we limit seafood to only several times per week? All right, so some great questions there. Um, I can start with, with, uh, with this. So when you cook with wine, oftentimes it, uh, it's gonna get evaporated, if you will, it's gonna kind of cook out the alcohol content. So it's really gonna, add that flavor component. But any recipe that does have wine, um, you can easily substitute it with water um, just for extra liquid, or even if you want extra flavor, um, different broths like vegetable, vegetable or chicken broth. Um, so you, so if you do, if you are cautious about that, there's easy substitutions. But um, when you're cooking with wine, it's really going to be cooked out. So you don't have to worry about it so much. And the second part of that question, I believe, was um, 
talking about seafood and the dietary guidelines recommend eating seafood at least twice, twice per week. Um, you know, if you're somebody that, you know, has access to more you know, seafood, um, certainly, you know, include that in your diet as you're able, um, again, following that overall dietary pattern that we talked about. Great. Uh, we have time for a couple more questions. What does the research say about smoking points of oils and how should we, how should we use this information when cooking with oils? So just to, to review here, a smoking point of um, oil is really going to be the temperature that certain oils are going to start to burn and smoke. So um, there's so many types of oils out there, um, you know, olive oil, vegetable oil, safflower oil, avocado oil, and they all have different uh, smoke points, if you will. So um, off the top of my head, uh, I know avocado, for avocado oil, for example, it has a higher smoking point, which means you can if you're cooking at high temperatures, you know, that's not going to burn as, as quickly. But olive oil um, has a low smoking point. So you, um, you notice, you may have even done this before if you were sauteing veggies and you, you're using olive oil and you have the temperature on high, you'll kind of start smelling or seeing smoking. And that's because olive oil has a low smoke point. So um, vegetable oils like um, uh, uh, canola oil, you know, that kind of, is, kind of falls in the middle. Um, I hope that answered that question. <laughs> I, I will just add that we, you know, the question I think says, what does the research say? <clears throat> um, it's really hard to, to measure these things in, in populations. Um, you know, you can do laboratory studies um, and look at the impact on, on, in, on cells. Um, but I think, you know, as a precautionary principle, we would say, you know, if try not to have your oil smoking because, you know, there, those are um, potentially carcinogenic um, compounds that are being created, but the research is pretty sparse. So speaking of oils then, is ghee a healthy alternative to butter and oil? And if so, when should we use it? Oh, that's it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you did say that, right? So ghee is a, it's clarified butter. Um, and often, you know, you'll find that in Indian cuisine or even Middle Eastern cuisine. Um, and it's, it's not that it's a, a better substitute for some of those oils. It's just going to have a very different flavor profile. Um, so ghee is very nutty versus olive oil, which is going to have hints of, you know, olives. Um, and going to be a little bit lighter in flavor. So again, um, I think it's it's not that you have to use one or the other. I think depending on what you're cooking and the flavors you're achieving, um, would one may be better than the other. And then again, you know these are fats, so we still want to encourage you know people to use them in moderation, as far as even when you're cooking with them. Great. We'll take two more questions. Uh, does it matter how you consume fruits and veggies, such as in a smoothie, as long as you get a good amount of fiber in your diet? That's a great question. Um, I, can, I can start with that. You know, it, I think it's all about, you know, how you're getting fruits and vegetables. If it's easier for some people to, to do that in a smoothie form, that's great. Um, you're still gonna get the, the vitamins, minerals, and fiber in there. Um, it's all about what is best for each individual because we're, we're all going to be different. Um, every day is going to look different. You know, some days you may, the only way you're going to get your recommended amount of fruit and vegetable intake is going to be if you have that, you know, smoothie in the morning. Um, for some, it, you know, they may not need that smoothie to get that intake in. So it's all about each person, um, but certainly that does count towards that serving. Uh, not based on any uh, particular evidence, but uh, I, I would also add just from watching my kids, um, you know, a smoothie is often seems to be an ex excuse to put ice cream or something. In it. So I think it depends how you're making your smoothie. Uh, I think the getting the whole fruit is always going to be better. Um, but, you know, if you're adding additional 
not so healthy items to that smoothie, then you're potentially being counterproductive. Yeah, that, that's a great point, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> noted and this is this question is is after my own heart uh is dark chocolate okay in moderation and what is considered moderation all right yeah that's a, a great question so yeah i mean again dark chocolate is going to be great oftentimes if you think about dark chocolate and the taste of it too it's just gonna have um, not as sweet so there's just not as much added sugar it's more of the the cocoa in there um and moderation, I'm kind of going off the top of my head here. Um, but if you think about kind of a domino, that's going to be about one to two ounces would be a, you know, good, good to stay, stay around. I know that's hard for me. <laughs> that will definitely be a challenge, but I'll keep that in mind moving forward. Okay, and we'll take our last question here. Uh, what do we know about GMOs and cancer risk? Uh, that there's no, no, no increased risk uh, of of cancer with GMO products. Um, you know that there is no um, identifiable increased risk. And you know, again, the eating uh, there's no benefit to choosing non-GMO. Uh, plant products over um, GMO ones, so no concern. Okay, great. Thank you so much to both of you for your time today and for being here with us. We have been so honored to have you in this virtual capacity. I know you were actually supposed to be in person last year, so um, this is very welcomed and, and long overdue. So thank you both so much for joining us here today. Yeah.